Hi! <laughs> You're probably wondering why the heck are you in a room full of red and white balloons with a romantic fire behind you and um, pink ambiance. Uh, well, it's Valentine's Day, you goofball. And what better way to discuss the most romantic time of the year than with some of the loneliest men in the high renaissance era. Yeah, and not because they didn't have wives or weren't in some sort of relationship, but because they all shared an idea that was kind of frowned upon by the Catholic Church during this era and were chastised for it. Some even taken to trial for heresy. So, without further ado, um, we're going to be talking about astronomy. No, not astrology for you ladies out there who this year are saying, sorry sir, I can't date you because you're not an Aries. That's fine. But we aren't talking about that. We're talking about how planets work and gravity and what the truth is using mathematical equations, laws, all that jazz from all these wonderful figures. So, let's <clears throat> begin. So, Nicholas Copernicus, 1473 to 1543, he's from Poland, he's a priest, humanist, portrait painter, doctor, astronomer, basically your dream renaissance man. This guy has it all. So he published On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres in 1543. Now, he originally did not write this in 1543. He wrote this way earlier, but he postponed his publication of this book simply because he knew he was going to get flack for it because it was introducing an entire new concept, one that went against Bible. as per Martin Luther and the Catholic Church during this time. So what exactly did Nicholas Copernicus introduce? Well, this man introduced the idea of heliocentrism, which basically means that instead of the earth being the center of the universe, it's the sun. Kind of common sense test right now, right? But Back then, when all they had was the Bible, and that's basically how the laws were written, how politics were arranged, was simply from the Bible. Um, but when you had someone coming out with this whole new idea, this whole new concept that, no, actually, the Bible is incorrect, and you all are incorrect, it's as, they took it as a huge hit, like one going against God. I do want to say that even though these scientists were coming out with hypotheses and observations and all this new information, all this new data, it wasn't that they were secular and they were trying to prove God's non-existence, but in fact, these scientists were mainly Christian. They were very heavily involved in religion. So it wasn't that they were trying to go against God in any way, shape, or form. It's just they were trying to educate the world on a more plausible reasoning. And in their eyes, that's what God would want them to do. Copernicus's heliocentric view challenged the Bible. The geocentric view that the Catholic Church had that the Bible presented. So if you're unfamiliar, the book of Joshua talks about these Israeli children who are fighting an enemy and it's getting dark outside, they can't see, so in order to help the children see and defeat their enemy, God stopped the sun so that way it could stay light for them. We're gonna read some scripture. Joshua 10:13. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jashar, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. So, according to the Catholic Church, Copernicus was a fool and trying to challenge the, the big guy, the main authority of the land. Actually, it doesn't end there. You would think, and of course, I do want to emphasize that this was a theory. 
theory. It wasn't proven. Copernicus was not a mathematician. He didn't have the tools to study this. This was literally just an idea. Wasn't proven, nothing to back it up, until our man Tycho Brahe. This guy, <laughs> I can't. So Tycho Brahe, 1546 to 1601. He's Danish, has a ginormous observatory. He is very wealthy and dedicated, literally. 20 years of looking into the sky and charting every night by himself from the same spot because he noticed from all the data gathered from previous astronomers um, that it was all different. Nothing really aligned, huh. Nothing really aligned, nothing really matched with, every, like, with each other's data. So he said the best way to gather this information, the best way to study this, is to literally study it from one spot every night consistently. And he built this ginormous observatory because, like I said, this guy was wealthy, loaded, so much cash. Um, and we're gonna get into a little bit of his wealth a little later. Even though Tycho had loads and loads of data, we're talking 20 years of data, he wasn't a mathematician. No, he wasn't. And he had nothing to mathematically prove any of it. But someone by his bedside does. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But first, fun fact, he had a fake nose. This man, Nose job. A renaissance nose job is what he had. So the story is he was at a party and got into a little bit of a tussle with a nobleman and they separated angrily, didn't talk to each other for a bit. This happened on December 10th. Mm -hmm. And Tycho was around 20 years old when all of this occurred. So December 10th, they got into it just a little bit, decided to back off, said, mm -mm, you ain't worth it, not doing it. But on December 27th, they got back into it, man. Full on tussle to the, like tussle to the bustle. I don't even know if that's a phrase, but they were going into it. And um, they decided, let's have a duel, because this is what they did back in these days. And on the 29th, they did. And it was a little too dark, and the nobleman, kind of just sliced and guess who's uh <laughs> guess whose nose tip got cut off bra so um instead of getting a like new nose tip and make it out of wax or whatever this dude <laughs> this dude makes it out of a gold alloy and silver and not only that but he was so skillful at applying it that it looked like a real nose. Gold, just on the tip of his nose. I'm sure that'd be a wonderful first date story. Hey, so, um, fun little fact about me. My nose is fake. <laughs> what if he's like at dinner with, <laughs> with someone and he sneezes and it falls <laughs> into the food? I can't, oh my gosh. I don't know, Bra's just an interesting dude. When you have wealth, you have entertainment. Very eccentric character. Um, we love Tycho Bra. I highly recommend, if you get the chance, just do some research on that guy. He's really cool. Oh, oh and an even more interesting story. So he was at a dinner and really had to urinate so bad, but he didn't go because that would be improper etiquette. He felt that it would insult the host. So he held it in, and when he got home that night, he didn't have to go anymore. Only a, He only passed a little bit of urine, and um, there was actually a blockage, and it ended up making him delirious, caused him a whole bunch of liver issues, and he was on his deathbed. And as he was on his deathbed, he kept repeating the words, Let me not seem to have lived in vain. Over and over and over again until he died. And who was on his bedside to hear him say that over and over and over and over again? 
Johannes Kepler. He was a mathematician. There's our missing puzzle piece. He um, was hired as an assistant for Bra, and he was by his side for most of his data collection. So we have Copernicus with the idea, Tycho with the data, Kepler with the math to explain the data. Okay, so that's what we've got going on so far. Not only does he, does he prove this heliocentric idea um, introduced by Copernicus, but he also comes up with a few laws himself. So law number one, the orbits of planets are elliptical. They're not circular. What they thought back in the high Renaissance age in the 16th century, they thought that planets rotated like this, circular. But according to Kepler, the planets actually rotated like this. So kind of like a slanted circle. His second law was that the planets don't move at uniform speed. So they all move different speeds, different rates, different times, full, like they don't move all together at once. And then his third law, this one's the mathy one. The square of the ratio of the periods of any two planets revolving about the sun is equal to the cube of the ratio of their average distances from the sun. I don't know about you, but I feel like, what? <laughs> what? Yeah, it looks like it proves it. That works. So this brings us to our big kahuna, Galileo Galilei, 1564 to 1642. He's a really good observer. He's Italian, a Florentine specifically, and uh, try not to fall for him <laughs> because a lot of things fell for him. Let me explain. So uh, he lived in Florence, which uh, if you've ever been to Florence, Pisa is just a little ways away from Florence. Like they're, they're sister cities. Galileo Galilei went up to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa and dropped multiple things from the top. One of Galileo Galilei's biggest ideas and biggest contributions to the science world was you can't sit there and just think about things. You can't just, hmm, yeah, I, I bet that's how that works. You can't do that. That's not how science works. This was, of course, before any sort of official scientific method. So, Galileo Galilei said, you need to observe. You have to see it happen over and over and over and over again to create a law, which he did. And how did he do that? Well, from the top of Pisa, he dropped a whole bunch of different objects at different weights and noticed that they all fell at the same time. Like if he dropped a brick, it would fall at the same time that a feather being dropped from the Leaning Tower of Pisa hit the ground same time. Didn't matter the weight, it would all hit the same. He then constructed the laws of motion and the laws of inertia to explain events that were happening in nature. He was also the first to use a telescope as a scientific instrument rather than just something to see a ship really far away. Um, so he actually built his own telescope which is super exciting and Using this telescope, he proved Copernicus' theory through observation. And he also discovered that planets aren't perfect orbs. And he backs that up with the faces of the moon. So overall, the worldview prior to the 16th and 17th century was simply theological. But the 17th century and post 17th century had a scientific worldview. This is how it was shifting. The Catholic Church so resented the Copernican theory, and the Pope noticed this. The Pope asked Galileo to write a book that would express both sides, the heliocentric side and the geocentric side, but not to pick one, just to introduce both ideas to the public. And Galileo did this. In a book called The Dialogue, he presented both sides, but was accused by the church of actually picking the heliocentric side when discussing the two 
primary world systems. And in 1633, he was put on trial by the Catholic Church for heresy. And he was actually found guilty and was forced to retract his statements, which he did. And then was put on house arrest for the rest of his life. But hey, he's a bad boy, ladies. This brings us to another Pikahuna figure, and that is, as you all know, Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton used all of this info gathered from all of these different people, Kepler, Bra, Galileo, Copernicus, and he created an overarching theory of the universe. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, this man was humble. So basically Isaac Newton locked himself in a room for 18 months and just did physics. That was what he did. He then published Principia in 1687, detailing how exactly gravity works. All matter attracts all other matter, whether for- Oh, no, he was an Englishman. We have to use the accent. All matter attracts all other matter with a force proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. I know that was a horrible accent and I, pro I really apologize. I can really only do Australian, um, but even then it's not that great, mate. But crikey, we try every day. Um, <laughs> I know it sucks, I'm so sorry if I offended you. But um, basically what this says is gravity. And I'm sure you all have heard under the apple tree story with Isaac Newton, which isn't confirmed, it's just a myth, but uh, apparently Isaac Newton was sitting under an apple tree, the apple fell from the tree, hit him in the head, and he had this... He had this... He had this eureka moment glasses because we're about to discuss Isaac Newton's laws of gravity. Law number one. A body at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by a force. Two. Law number two. A body in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Oh my gosh, I'm going a little bit Australian there. Three. A change in motion is a direct result of the amount of force exerted on that object. And four, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And he also says, just full of quotes, natural laws are unchangeable and predictable. God's active participation in the natural world is not needed to explain the forces of nature. So, this brings out an entire new realm of thought. I also want to say really quickly that Isaac Newton also was not secular. Most of these scientists were not secular. In fact, Isaac Newton studied physics just as much as he studied the Bible. He was a Christian man, and he didn't mean to bring about this idea um, that a whole bunch of people were coming through with this religious movement. Even though he was Christian, he accidentally gravitated. <laughs> he accidentally, <laughs> I can't say that again, people away from religion with this new supplement to science, which isn't what he was trying to do at all. Basically, this group of people, this new religious movement, people were saying, then what do you need God for then? No amount of prayer is going to make God stop natural laws. And that's true. Let's say someone's falling off of a roof of a building. And on the way down, they're praying, God, please stop this natural law, this natural law of gravity from killing me. And then what, angels are going to come and swoop this man off and save him? No. This idea was God created these natural laws and that's how he's leaving them. This new religious concept 
was deemed deism, which is like a proprietor for the common saying, it really be like that sometimes. <laughs> um, but anyway, he also invented calculus. So next time you're sitting there in calculus class, hating it, you can thank our good old man, Isaac Newton. So anyway, um, these views were dominant in the Western world up until Einstein in the 1900s, which is wonderful. I think the evolution of science in the High Renaissance era from the 16th, 17th century and onward was a big step for humankind. And I, I were thankful, honestly, for Copernicus and Bra and Kepler and Galileo and Isaac Newton. We're thankful for them challenging the system because something that's really sad that was going on around this um, time was persecution, religious persecution. The church really went hard at people. And when they came into this world, said, hey, that's kind of stupid. <laughs> and, you know, tried to bring about logic and reason and actually put some, some real knowledge in these people. They were persecuted hard, especially Galileo. He was put on trial. He was on house arrest for the rest of his life. And it just really sucks that that's the case, but we wouldn't be here without them. So thank you, all, all of you. Um, I thought that'd be super nice to celebrate Valentine's Day with some of the loneliest men in history. And um, they are definitely out of this world. But anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you learned a lot.